Hi again, and welcome back to this fourth and final week of our study of John chapters 12 through 14. In so many ways, tonight's study is the frosting on the cake. And if you bear with the analogy, you know, in order to have a frosted cake, you first have to have a cake. You've got to have the cake before you can frost it. And, and so it is with tonight. We couldn't study tonight unless we'd studied these other parts before. Chapters 12, 13, the beginning of 14. It sets us up to truly grasp what we're going to see tonight. A frosting and a cake are complete. You put them together and it is complete. And, and tonight completes a picture. Completes a picture of our God, Father, Son, and tonight, Holy Spirit. We'll look at the third person of our Trinity, of our God, the Holy Spirit. And finally, when, when a cake is frosted, what you see is the frosting. And in so many ways, we're, as we look at the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, is what is the world sees. And so we're going to unpack that tonight as we look at the second half of chapter 14, the book of John. And these first few verses are just kind of packed. So we're going to take them one by one, starting with verse 15. I'm going to encourage you, if you would, to open a Bible with me and, and read along as we complete this 14th chapter in John. But first, can I just open this in prayer? Lord, would you be with us tonight? And would you allow us to be able to see through John's eyes the Holy Spirit, who he is, and how we engage with him? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning with verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. Short verse. Jesus is saying, though, that loving him means putting his commands into action. Love put into action, keeping his commands. He says, if you do love me, keep my commands. It, he, he equates the two. Similarly, he had said, you know, if you love me, it means you believe in me and you'll be doing the works I'm doing. Here he says, keep my commands. The other thing that he's calling out here is that He's defining who you is. And that's going to be important as we look at these verses. You, he's talking to his disciples. He's talking to us. If you are a follower of Jesus, if he's your Lord and Savior, then he's talking to you. So he says you. That's who you is in these verses. Those who believe in Jesus, love him, and are keeping his commands. Now in verse 16, he continues, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. Verse 16 is an absolute treasure of Scripture. There aren't many verses, there are a few in the Bible, which give us a glimpse of the Trinity, the three persons of God in one place. And this is one of them. This is perhaps the clearest because it gives us relationship and, and role and connection. This, this is all... Three persons of our God in one place. The Father. The Father who later Jesus is going to say is greater than I. And, and we can see it here because Jesus is going to ask the Father. He's going to say, Father, send them another counselor. And then the Father sends another counselor, the Holy Spirit, another advocate. The Father is sending the Spirit. And the Spirit is then the one who is, will live with us, will live in us. Jesus is playing the role of, of our in intercessor. He's be beseeching the Father on our behalf, and the Father is then sending the Spirit. What a great picture of God in three persons and, and the relationship between them. Jesus is introducing him now to this com completion of that picture of who God is. And Jesus shows that, that he is the way to the Father, but he's also showing us here that he's the reason that we receive the Holy Spirit from the Father. Now, the next question, the next thing to unpack is who is the Holy Spirit? We're receiving the Spirit of Truth, this advocate. And, and I, you know, the first time I studied this, I came to realize something, that the Holy Spirit is almost more than we can describe it. 
Let me tell you why I say that. I I was going to have to teach a devotional on on this um, particular verse, and so I looked it up and and I I saw a counselor. He will give you another counselor, and then I looked in a different translation. I saw advocate, and I said, well, wait a minute, which is it? So. I went and started to look it up a little bit. I, I went on BibleHub.com. You ever done that? Going out online. And, and on Bible had a great resource online for you know look, studying the Bible. And I said, I want to see parallel translations. So I selected parallel. And you can see all the different translations laid out. Well, the, num- the names that I saw. Yes, there's counselor, advocate, companion, comforter, helper, friend. And, and spirit of truth, spirit of God, spirit of Christ. I, I, all of a sudden I'm realizing, hmm. is this a picture of a disagreement between Bible scholars? And the answer is no, it's not. It's more just an insufficiency of our words. You see, we have a word to put in verse 16 to represent the Holy Spirit. And every one of these is right. And there's many more. And yet, so, so it's just that we don't have the words to describe it, the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 17, Jesus takes it a step further. He says, now, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus is using this word, the world, and um, in, in the Gospel of John, this word is confusing. The, the word world is used 78 times in the Gospel of John. And it's used interchangeably to mean different things. Sometimes it means the creation, the earth, the sphere that we live on. Sometimes it means all inhabitants of the earth, like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world he doesn't just love some of the mankind he created. He loves the world, all the inhabitants of the earth. But then sometimes it means, like it does here, those that have rejected Jesus. And it contrasts the world with those that love Christ. So that's what we see here. Introduction of the world. And the world cannot see the Holy Spirit. But we, but we can. Followers of Jesus can. And then there's one last thing he points out, because he says, for you know him, he, for he lives with you and will be in you. Lives with you and will be in you. Those are two different tenses. Lives with you, he's saying, the spirit is already at work, enabling you to understand even just the, what you little you do grasp that I'm sharing with you. The spirit was already at work with them. But then Jesus looks ahead to when the spirit will be in them. The day of Pentecost, the day after Jesus has died, been in the tomb, risen again, appeared to many, and then ascended into heaven. And now he asks the Father, and the Father sends another counselor. And the day of Pentecost, that Holy Spirit descends on disciples, and they are now have this God in them. And this is the completion of that, that journey that we saw last week. What started as as God and us in the garden. We walked together. But then because of sin, it became God separate from us. And God over his people during the the early years of the, the Old Testament, right? Maintaining a remnant until Moses, and Moses establishes a tabernacle in the wilderness, a dwelling place where the most holy of holies was the place for God's very presence to dwell among us. And it became God among us. And at the temple, it was God among us until a baby was born in, G- in, in Bethlehem. And Jesus, Jesus, who would be known as Emmanuel, is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And now Jesus comes to point us to a new relationship, even closer than God with us, which is God in us. Because he says, I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to send another counselor and he will be with you and will be in you, in us, God in us. And this is what gives us just a taste, a real taste, but just a taste of what it will be like again 
in our Father's house, when God brings all things to completion, when Jesus returns again, takes us home, it will be God and us once again in his presence. Jesus is showing us, taking us to the doorstep of the completion of what God has planned. Now, having introduced the Holy Spirit, Jesus now begins to unpack an assurance that comes with the Holy Spirit that he wants his disciples to know and he wants us to know. And that is that we're not alone. I want you to just remember, these, are, these disciples are just, they're kind of overwhelmed. I mean, think what's going on. We've been studying this for weeks and this has happened in minutes, right? John chapter 13 and 14 is, is literally a conversation that's maybe happened over an hour or so. I don't know what the timing is, but it's that it's that condensed a time. And he has been just revealing thing after thing after thing to them. And so he, he now wants to assure them. He wants them to understand. And these are the disciples that in and chapter 13, he says, my dear children, he aches for them. He says, I am troubled in spirit. One of you is going to betray me. He aches for them. And now listen to the words he says to give assurance. I will not leave you as orphans. He's talking to his disciples, but he's talking to us. I will not leave you as orphans. Orphans, those that don't have a parent, they don't have a father, that don't belong, that, that don't have an inheritance. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. As he looks ahead to his risen self appearing to many, you will see me. And then because I live, you will live. And now he looks ahead to a day. He says, on that day, you will realize I'm in the Father and you are in me, and I am in you. That day that the Father sends the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, to live in us, that's the day that he says, you will realize I am in you. That's the relationship we have. The Holy Spirit completes this picture. It completes the circle. Yes, we learn that Father and Son are one. They're close. They work in the family business together, right? We got that. But he says, on that day, there's going to be a day where not only do you know that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me, not only do you know that, that you're in me, but he says, now you realize that I'm in you. The circles are complete. This is, now you are. Those you believe in me, you are now sons of light. You are in me and I am in you. And every day since Pentecost, when someone places their faith in Christ, says, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. I accept your work on the cross for my sins. God sends the spirit of truth to dwell in them, to be with them and live in them on that day. Verse 21, Jesus continues. He says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Remember we talked about Jesus saying that, you know, there's light and darkness. And he was painting a stark choice. And here he takes us back to that stark choice. Do you love Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? He is the Son of God. He is our Messiah. He's the one God promised. Do you believe that? Have you placed your faith in that and in him? And if so then he and the Father will come and be with you and show themselves to you and love you. That's the choice. That's either that, and that's the one way to experience the indwelling of God is through faith in Jesus. You see, the work has already been done. 
we're reading this, it's in the past tense. Jesus, as he's talking to the disciples in chapter 14, hasn't gone to the cross yet, but he will. And we know that. We know he's going to, that march to the cross was unstoppable. Jesus dies on the cross for our sin, defeats death, rising again. All that work is done. It's finished. The offer stands. But see, God has an opt-in policy, to put it in marketing speak. You have to opt in. You can't just opt out. You have to say, yes, I want it. Yes, I want to be redeemed. Yes, I want to be counted as your child, as your son. I want inheritance with Christ. We have to opt in. I think of it this way. It's kind of like a wedding invitation. You get an invita wedding invitation in the mail. You open it up and it tells you about the wedding. That wedding is going to happen. That marriage is going to happen. And the question is, are you going to RSVP? Are you going to opt in? If you do, there is a place for you. Just like that room in your father's house, there is now a place for you at the reception. It's got your name on it. And that's the opting in. Only if we were at RSVP, only if we opt in. The other truth that comes well with that opting in is this, is that it's not just about getting in the door, but it's about experiencing the relationship. Because he's talking about to truly experience the relationship, keep my commands, right? He st we started with, if you love me, keep my commands. And that's not just a direction. That's not just a, a to-do. That's a key part of the relationship. If we're keeping his commands, if, if, we're, if we're following, if we're trusting him, if we're doing his work, then we are learning, we're getting to experience and we're getting to learn more and more about who our God is, who our Father is. The Spirit in us is doing the work of helping us to understand who God is. And that more and more we get to experience the fullness of that relationship. It would be like the difference, let's take that wedding invitation again, right? It'd be that a difference of, well, yeah, I RSVP'd and I'm coming, but I really don't know anyone very well. I mean, I'm... I haven't done a lot to stay connected with that family. Or maybe you're someone that works in the family business. <laughs> and so you you know them. And when you show up at the wedding, big hug at the door. Well, maybe not in COVID days, but they greet you at the door. They're glad to see you. You just enjoy the company because you know each other. They know you. You know them. It That's what it's like here. The more we're engaged in keeping his commands, doing his work, the more we experience that relationship with God. And Jesus now gives us a glimpse at what role the Holy Spirit plays in that, because the Holy Spirit is central to us having that experience of the relationship. Let me read verses 25 through 27. Read with me. All this I've spoken while still with you, but the Advocate the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus is starting to unpack who the Holy Spirit is and what he does in us. And there's a lot of, some things he calls out specifically here, and there's some things that are actually inferred that we need to, we need to add, we need to kind of unpack and look into. First of all, he tells us point blank, will teach us all things, teach you all things. The rest of scripture just confirms that. 2 Corinthians 3.16 says, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil, like a wedding veil, is taken away. We can see clearly, we can now understand, we can now grasp truth once the Spirit comes. Once we turn to the Lord, we receive the Holy Spirit and the veil is taken away. That's the work of the Spirit. John 16, 13 says, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Sounds like Jesus. I'm not, these are not my words of the Father's, right? And he will disclose to you what is to come. The Holy Spirit will teach us all things. 
And so, yes, that's a key thing we can count on. The Holy Spirit is enlightening us. It's giving us wisdom and understanding. But then the rest of what Jesus shares actually talks about how the Holy Spirit equips us. And, and, and what I want you to see is just I want you to see how confidently Jesus states this and then how that relates to the equipping of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, let me read it again. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the word gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Those are, those are universal statements. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Be untroubled. Be unafraid. Be at peace. How's that going to happen? Through the Spirit. And it's through a myriad of things that the Spirit does in us. First of all, the Spirit empowers and equips us. Strengthens us. Ephesians 3.16 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. That strength comes from the Holy Spirit. And then with that strength, he even will give us the words to say. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Luke 12.11 says, don't worry what you'll say. The Holy Spirit will give you what to say. The Holy Spirit even equips us with what to say. So we don't have to be troubled. We don't have to be afraid. We can be at peace. All so that we can take part and be doing the work that Jesus was doing and go on to do even greater things than these. Be engaged in the family business. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. We are equipped to do the work that God has us to do that he's prepared in advance for us to do, and that is how we get to experience our relationship. Whatever that work is, being Jesus, doing what Jesus called us to do, as we do that, we get to experience God. And the Holy Spirit equips us for that. And as the Holy Spirit equips us, what the world sees is the fruit, is the frosting. Galatians 5, and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. As we follow the equipping and the strengthening of the Spirit, the fruit appears. Peace, they're right there. Jesus says, my peace I give you. My peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Yes, because the Spirit in us will produce that peace. We don't need to be troubled. We don't need to be afraid. The Holy Spirit is doing that work in us. In verse 28, and then Jesus kind of brings it back, back to the task at hand. And as we close out these three chapters, let me just read these last few verses. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I've told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. This tender time of of just revealing what's going to take place to his disciples, of preparing them, of giving them hope and assurances. This time is drawing to a near. We've been in this sheltered room together, and now it's time to get up and go. Come on, let us leave. It's time to step out, and we need to start the walk from here, Jerusalem, down through the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. We have an appointment there. I'm beginning my path to the cross. But he says, before I go, before I go, let's recap, he says. And then he reminds them, 
You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back to you because I am the way. And I'm going to come back to you to take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Yes, I am going away, but I am coming back. He says, the Father is greater than I. You know me. You know him. Because I am in the Father and the Father is in me. He says, I tell you now so that you will believe. Jesus is just as in control of the situation now as he was in that entrance into Jerusalem in chapter 12. I am in control. I've set the plan in motion. The fuse is lit. The countdown's begun. The Father and I are in control, and I'm doing exactly what my Father has commanded me. The enemy will take me soon, but the Father and I are the ones calling the shots. And then he ends with, come now, let us leave. I'm picturing him looking at his disciples going, I know, I know, come on. Come on, just stick with me. Come on, we gotta go. And he's hurting for them, knowing what he's about to do. But it's also an invitation for us. What I hear is, come now, let us leave. Come now, let us love Jesus and keep his commands, loving one another because by this, everyone will know that his, we're his disciples. And now that we know these things, we'll be blessed if we do them. He says, come now, let us leave that old life behind. Be willing to, to set aside that, that old picture of who a father is so that we can grasp the new. Set aside the old picture of, of the old covenant so we can grasp the new relationship with God. Come now, let us set aside the old. Take hold of something, an opportunity that's so much greater than we could imagine. Come now, let us leave. Let us leave to step out to do the Father's work as the Spirit equips us and enables us and gives us peace. And we'll do even greater things than these because Jesus is going to the Father. That's our invitation. As our invitation is to step out. So as we close in prayer, I just want to encourage you, whatever... God has stirred in you as we've gone through this study. Whatever may be in your discussion time that you've, you've, you've um, thought about that God's brought to mind, that the Spirit has brought to mind or brought to remembrance, whatever that has stirred in you, that come now that God's speaking to you about. I'm going to ask God if he'll help you to grow in that area. So would you pray with me? Lord God, Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you again for John how you used him to capture the words of Jesus, to help us see you. Thank you that in Jesus we experience our Father in heaven, that we can follow you. Thank you that as we keep your commands, as we do your work, you equip us. Would you stir in us, whatever it is you, you would want to show us from this, would you stir that in us? Would you help us? through your spirit, to be able to respond, to be able to follow you. And to remember what you've said, what you've done, and what you want us to do. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus and for the Father's glory. Amen. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 730, led by one of our pastors or another Shoreline leader. To join, please visit our Wednesday Night at Shoreline online page, on your website and click join discussion next to the group with the first letter of your last name. This will launch the Google Meet conference meeting, which you can connect using any device that has a camera. We look forward to spending time with you in deeper reflection and discussion. See you there.